Okay, so I may have gone a little clickbaity with the thumbnail and title here. Don't look up, Adam McKay's 2021 climate change by way of giant meteor movie isn't that bad for a liberal take on climate change. That said, the biggest compliment I can give this movie is also a failed insult. It's pretty good for a liberal take on climate change. As we have seen in the real world, liberalism has proven less than effective at curtailing global warming, and this movie and its associated action campaign provide a window into why that is. Also, quick disclaimer, in this video I'm going to be critiquing liberalism, a center-right ideology, from the left. If you're a Republican who would rather watch someone ranting in their truck about how climate change is a Jewish or Chinese conspiracy there in the US or whatever, this video is not for you. Sorry. You know, some people say global warming is a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese. But I say, show me the receipts! Because why would Xi Jinping want to flood my basement and rest my boat legs? To what end? Let's start with a brief summary of the movie. Two scientists, played by Jennifer Lawrence and Leo DiCaprio, discover a comet the size of Mount Everest that's on a collision course with Earth. If it should hit, the chances of which are pretty much 100%, all life on Earth would certainly be wiped out. Through the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, which is apparently a real thing, they take this to the President of the United States, basically a gender-flipped Trump played by Meryl Streep, who's completely in the pocket of her major donors and has appointed her own son as her chief of staff. Side note, Meryl Streep is having the time of her life in this role, chewing all of the scenery and it's the best part of the movie. She blows them off, afraid that acting on this information will somehow make her unpopular and negatively affect midterms, even though the solution is literally to shoot a nuke at the meteor, which you'd think her base would love. Realizing they've been blown off, they leak the stories to the press and the wider scientific community. Partly because of this, but mostly because the president needs a distraction from a scandal involving her Supreme Court nominee, the press does agree to act on this now, and an operation to steer the media, of course, with some nukes is set up. As this operation is being launched, however, the president is taken aside by an... eccentric tech billionaire, who's also one of her major donors. She promptly decides to turn the nukes around. Turns out the company of said tech billionaire has discovered a ton of precious metals within the asteroid, and wants to break them apart into more manageable pieces using the company's wildly ambitious, untested, not peer-reviewed, probably not functional technology, after which the metals could be extracted. The administration agrees to carry out this plan instead of the one that would actually work, and Leo's character is hired as his science advisor to the president, and now has to help sell the idea that this insane plan won't doom all life on Earth. A huge swath of the public is convinced to support this plan because of the jobs it was supposed to create. And there's even a not insignificant portion of the public that turns into meteor denialist, skeptical of the idea that the meteor even exists. How very clever and topical, Mr. McKay. Eventually, Leo's character comes to his senses, and he joins the other scientists in trying to turn the public against this plan through a campaign called Just Look Up. In response to this, the president coins the slogan Don't Look Up. Hey, that's the name of the show arguing that these elites only want you to look up so they can look down on you, and that they want to keep you afraid. This works, right up until the meteor can actually be seen with the naked eye, at which point it's too late to stop. Surprise surprise, the tech billionaire's plan doesn't work and everyone on Earth is wiped out. Except for a select few, mostly owners of large corporations, who get cryogenically frozen and put on a spaceship with the president in search of a livable planet. Roll credits. What I like about this movie, and something that's missing from a lot of liberal climate change rhetoric, is that it doesn't completely miss where the blame for climate inaction should be put. While the movie does go hard on the just listen to scientists shtick, it mostly doesn't blame individual people's inherent stupidity for it. It's made clear that big business plays a huge role in blocking true solutions to the problem and propagating doubt about the actually pretty clear science for monetary gain. In the movie, it's Zucker Musk over here who wants to profit off the materials in the meteor. And in real life, it's fossil fuel companies that have been funding climate change denial and lobbying policymakers to stay inactive for decades, despite the fact that scientific consensus about climate change was achieved decades ago. I also like how the wildly ambitious plan of the Steve Jobsian, Elon Muskian guy is a badly thought out plan that doesn't end up working and is only approved because of the promise of profiting off the meteor mirroring how wild geoengineering plans and promises of future scientific breakthroughs that will solve climate change are a huge gamble, and mostly just serves to distract from the obvious solutions that would hurt the bottom line of companies. I also love how his space arc idea is shown to only be an option for the wealthiest people in the world, which will absolutely be the case when any of the current proposed harebrained let's just ditch Earth and move to Mars plans ever comes to fruition. Okay, to be fair, Elon has offered poor people an indentured servitude scheme to get to Mars, so 
Maybe all the weird crypto bros are right about him, who's to say? As a side note, I also feel very seen by the fact that the tech genius messiah guy is actually a deeply awkward, borderline psychopathic personality vacuum who is somehow adored by masses of people and that he's not actually nearly as competent as he's thought to be. Anyway, it's made really clear that this creep is the real power behind the throne, which is absolutely true to life. That being said, the movie could stand to be a little clearer on who it's actually criticizing. The present character makes this movie feel a lot like a belated Trump era movie, considering that she's a self-obsessed vain celebrity with absolutely no knowledge or experience when it comes to governing, whose major donors have a huge amount of influence on our policy, but who nevertheless presents herself as a champion of the working people, and who puts similarly unqualified family members in key positions of power. She and her son even have a kind of reverse Trump Ivanka thing going on. Is that a rock solid 10 smoke show of a president or what? She wasn't my mother. Mother, get undressed this instant. The movie actually does a pretty good job of laying out why presidents don't take action on climate change. They're beholden to corporate donors who have an interest in not taking any climate change action because it might hurt their bottom line, and they're afraid climate change policy will make them unpopular, as the energy transition is going to have an effect on the economy and jobs in certain factors. So far, so good. But the problem is that it's very easy to read this movie not as a critique of US politicians in general, but only of the certain kind of Trumpian populist Republican that's obviously being satirized most heavily in this movie. It makes it very easy to think our climate woes are solved now that a more quote-unquote civilized, sensible, democratic president is in office, even though Democrats like Biden and Obama are just about as beholden to corporate donors as the Republicans, and pretty much just as hesitant to take any kind of drastic action on climate change. The most meaningful difference between Trump and Biden on climate change policy is that one of them actively spread doubt about the issue, whereas the other pays lip service to it being an important issue. And when it comes to actual policy outcomes, there's no real difference between those approaches. This feels like a good time to pull out the old Chomsky quote. In the US, there's basically one party, the business party. It has two factions, called Democrats and Republicans, which are somewhat different but carry out variations on the same policies. I'm opposed to those policies, as is most of the population. The same is true about this movie's portrayal of business interests influencing policy. You can read Mark Bezos as a stand-in for capital and big business as a whole, influencing climate policy because it serves their short-term material interests, but because he's just one guy, and because he's such a clear amalgam of several real-world weird tech billionaire guys, it's very easy to read him as a stand-in for just those guys, those few clearly unhinged industrialists with pie-in-the-sky ideas about how to solve the world's problems. At the very end of the movie, we do see that all sorts of fat cat capitalists are on board the spaceship that flees the Earth at the end, but it's a blink and you'll miss it moment. The focus on this one guy, as fun as a presence as he may be, hurts the clarity of the movie's message quite a bit. What's more, while the movie doesn't place the primary blame for inaction on climate change on the dumb, unwashed masses, it doesn't escape blaming them entirely. The people duped by the Don't Look Up campaign are quite clearly framed as uneducated hicks, as the stereotypical Trump voter who falls for very transparent lies because he just wants to rally against the elites. When j -Law's character goes home to her poor family at one point, it's revealed that they too fell for the president's campaign because of the jobs they think the comet will bring. I'm on two minds about this. On the one hand, there's a true, even somewhat sophisticated point in there. Trumpian pseudo-populist candidates do manage to win over certain blocks of white working class voters by appealing to the vague idea of elites who don't have their best interests at heart, even though they themselves represent those elites more than anyone, being completely in the pocket of big business. They sort of redirect the legitimate grievances of working class people towards a nebulous, immaterial notion of elites instead of who it should be aimed at, everyone who's on top of the capitalist power structure, creating a kind of false class consciousness. On that note, it's no coincidence that anti-Semitism is often called the socialism of fools, since the vague notion of elites is often a thinly veiled allusion to some kind of imagined Jewish conspiracy. On the other hand, blaming the working class for electing non-climate conscious people is just wrong. It's a myth that working class voters elected Trump. His voters were actually fairly evenly spread between economic classes, and many of his votes came from very wealthy people who weren't duped into anything. They just correctly identified the candidate who was most aligned with their material interests. Uh, Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX and Tesla, uh, building rockets and cars and solar stuff. And Most of its vote may come from the working class, but that's inevitable given the size of that demographic. Also, let's not forget that the Hillary's and Bidens of the world are not much better on the issue of climate change, or indeed any issues that would require them to go up against big business and the owning class. There's several reasons to get mad at a Trump voter, but climate change isn't one of them. 
because on that and many other issues, voters simply don't get any good options in the US, as well as in many other countries. The film does a similar thing with the media, correctly identifying them as spreaders of misinformation on climate change, but for the wrong reasons. It is sort of implied that the media are following the official party line of the president because of their corporate owners... maybe? But mostly, they just seem to misrepresent the facts because they don't want things to get too gloomy. And because the hosts are vapid airheads who don't like thinking about anything. Okay. Um, well, it's, um, you know, just something we do around here. You know, we just keep the bad news light. Right, it helps the medicine go down. That is certainly not the primary reason why many networks don't cover climate change accurately, or even actively spread misinformation. The primary reason is that most news shows are owned by giant conglomerates and funded by billionaires who all have a shared interest in spreading doubt about climate change, because serious strides in the transition to clean energy risk hurting their bottom line. They are also funded largely through advertising from companies that, again, have a vested interest in people not taking climate change seriously. So when it comes to the causes of climate change in action, this movie makes some questionable choices in the framing of it all. And it may sometimes lash out at the uneducated working poor a little too much. But overall, it does diagnose the problem correctly. Corporate interests having a vested interest in not changing the way they operate, influencing politicians to make sure they don't do anything rigorous, spreading false doubts among the populace. As I said, pretty good for a liberal take on climate change. Where it falters most seriously though, is when it comes to proposed solutions. When it comes to solutions for climate change in action, the movie doesn't suggest much more than Listen to the goddamn qualified scientists. Yes, Ariana Grande is in this movie, let's just move on. As the COVID pandemic has shown us, listening to scientists is definitely not a given when it comes to policy, and it is obviously important. But it very rarely translates directly into policy, so it's not entirely clear what McKay means by this. The people telling us to transition to clean energy sources are scientists, but so are the people who propose wildly dangerous geoengineering projects like blotting out the sun or dumping a shit ton of plankton into the sea. And so are the corporately employed scientists who assure us that technology will eventually solve climate change without companies having to change anything, while being suspiciously vague on details. So listen to the scientists can mean a great deal of things. Some sensible, some not. If the biggest problem the movie had was its vagueness, then I probably wouldn't be so harsh on it. The movie obviously doesn't have an obligation to be a comprehensive guide on stopping climate change. If the message were just, listen to scientists, which means at the very least acknowledge the overwhelming consensus that anthropogenic climate change is real, then that would be fine. I even think it's fine that this movie is absolutely preaching to the choir, because I don't know how you would make a movie like this appeal to climate change denialists without just completely obfuscating the message. I don't even agree with the reading of the film that calls it defeatist, as our protagonists absolutely do turn on the administration at the end and it's implied that it may even have worked if Leo hadn't allowed himself to be used as a mouthpiece for the administration in the first place. Besides, it's a cautionary tale, and those don't really work if you give them a happy ending. The problem is that the campaign around the movie does try to spur on people to take action on climate change, and it does so in a way that's confusing at best and actively harmful to the cause at worst. The website for the Don't Look Up campaign does include a few tips on political action, like organizing, keeping politicians accountable, and pressuring news outlets to report on climate change, even if they are a little vague on details and the approaches they do suggest are pretty toothless actions. However, the website spends an inordinate amount of room on individual consumer choices that you can take to personally reduce your ecological footprint. Ecological footprints, for those not in the know, measure an individual's impact on the planet and the environment. The concept was literally made up by British Petroleum to divert attention and responsibility on climate change from institutions like themselves to individuals. There's definitely a few things you can do as an individual to meaningfully reduce your climate impact, like not consuming animal products and not flying, but those options are not available to everyone, a lot of people literally cannot afford not to consume animal products for instance, and they distract from the fact that it's corporations, not individuals, who should be taken on if we actually want to stop climate change before it's definitively too late to save ourselves. Like, did you know that multiple airlines are literally flying empty planes around just to keep their airport slots, generating millions of tons of greenhouse gas emissions? There's nothing you can consume or not consume that will make that practice go away, and you would be literally unable to sustain yourself if you could only buy commodities that were produced in a sustainable manner. You can't consume yourself out of a potentially world-ending mess like this. After all, if BP wasn't convinced that the concept ecological footprint would do very little to decrease our global dependence on fossil fuels, they, a fossil fuel company, wouldn't have pushed the idea onto us. Tips like switch your energy provider and 
cut food waste may not be entirely worthless, but they do distract from what the actual goals of our efforts should be. Demanding that governments force companies to make the energy transition quickly, and maybe pushing for an economic system that doesn't give a handful of unaccountable capitalists so much power that they can literally end life on Earth without it being even illegal. I don't know what a system like that would even look like, but it would be cool, right? Disrupting the operations of energy companies, thereby hurting their bottom line, can also be a very effective strategy, but of course I'm only advocating for legal, non-destructive ways of doing so. On an unrelated note, watch this video. If we're gonna look at the approaches on climate action that director Adam McKay himself proposes, we find a similarly mixed bag. On the one hand, he stresses that we should switch to renewables and that we shouldn't let ourselves be distracted by fake solutions from fossil fuel companies and the press they buy, which... Good, that's all correct. On the other hand, he is literally advocating for carbon capture and removal, which is itself a scam pushed by fossil fuel companies and the press they buy. Oops. See what I mean when I say that listen to scientists is perhaps a little too broad of a statement? Okay, so Don't Look Up is not actually a bad climate change movie. It's also not even a bad movie, I think. Despite having written several pages about its flaws, I would still recommend you watch it. I just wouldn't want you to take the wrong message away from it. Listen to the scientists shouldn't mean that we fund pie-in-the-sky ideas so that we don't have to change anything about our current mode of production. It does mean that we should be listening to the immortal science of Mark. Listening to what the science tells us we should be doing now, and understanding that it's not the science we lack, but the political will to act on that science. Hey there, thanks for watching all the way to the end. If you like videos about the increasing likelihood of global warming killing us all, and why wouldn't you? Then you may like this other video I made as well, about the portrayal of global warming in the video game Horizon Zero Dawn. It would really help me in the algorithm if you clicked on that video right now, and or left a like and a comment on this video, and or subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications. Thank you very much if you choose to do any of those things.